And without further ado, our uh, special event of the night. We're really excited about this. Uh, something that started probably a year ago as an idea in the back row of one of these meetings that might have been going a little longer than it should have. Uh, <laughs> is to get a good series going. So we're going to learn um, and really uh, jump into a few topics. So what we're calling the Saluda to You Aquatic Entomology Series. And uh, I'll let John Gray, who's done a great work getting some great people together uh, for the next five months and kind of introduce what we're doing. Thanks, Jim. My name is John Gray. I am a member of the Saluda River TU chapter. I have been for some time, even though I live in Charlotte. I love to fish the Saluda River. I like it in the winter because the water is warm. You fish like that, and the air temperature is much warmer than it is in the mountains. So I'm a huge fan of the Saluda River. As you know, Trout Unlimited is all about cold water conservation, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But it occurred to me in one of these meetings about a year ago that a lot of people, including myself, come here because we want to learn more about fishing. So I thought one of the ways that we might be able to do that is to learn more about aquatic entomology. If you're like me, a lot of times when you go to the river, one of the questions you ask yourself and you struggle with is, what fly am I going to use today? There's a million different flies. Which one do I pick? What size? What color? When? And I think learning some about aquatic bugs will really help you with that. And to learn more about that, we put together a series in five parts to cover each of the major food groups that trout eat. And we're going to start off tonight with terrestrials. And I'm pleased to introduce Mike Waddell, who's a fine gentleman. And very knowledgeable on the subject. Yeah, He'll right. Take us off. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. I'll cut a few lights. Maybe we'll have a good little bit of see it better. Well, I've got to uh, get my pointer out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't fall asleep, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Should we leave the light on or? Might have a, well, there's some little side lights. See what you got. Yeah, is there something towards the back more? Yeah. This one's going to get some back. I'm going to make it. There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, John asked me to talk about terrestrials. Uh, I mean to say they're not aquatics. And Fortunately, tonight, when I talk about terrestrials, it's mostly going to be from Montana, because that's the only place I usually fish them. But I thought I'd talk about the hoppers, beetles, ants, and spiders, because that's the ones that we use most. So, that's all you need to know. Crickets. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, if they're not biting hoppers, you go some go to a nymph. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> so, like I said, hoppers are probably the most prominent terrestrial that I see out west. And as you can see, they come in a variety of colors, sizes. Uh, so, um, needless to say, you've got to have quite a few different varieties. And every year it changes, and it changes during the day. And this is just, I guess, put this up for the different types that we have. Um, you got the foams. Uh, these with the uh, deer hackle on the front. Um, now all these that are on here, this year we didn't use out west. Uh, and this is my box of the hoppers, and they're all bought that up out west when I was fishing out there. So, key to fishing for hoppers is first, be prepared that trout's going to hit that hopper with a vengeance. <clears throat> He's not going to sift it. He's going to grab it. And you better make sure that your tip is strong enough. Out west, I usually use 3X. And he's going to run with it. 
uh, size and color does matter on which river you are and what time of the day you are. Um, I, sometimes I'll put a dropper on as more of an attractor to get the trout to come up. Um, I have fished on the Henry's Fork in Idaho with two hoppers, one as a dropper, and two different types, and they'll slam either one of them. Uh, you need to put a little action into it, twitch it, uh, especially next to the bank. A lot of times I will cast it right on the bank and pull it off, and they're usually waiting right there, and they'll slam it. And aim for the prime time of the day. That the good news is, with hoppers, you don't have to get up at old dark 30 to go fishing for them. Okay? Usually about 9 o'clock, you can wander out there and they'll start to become active. And generally, the hot, the heat of the day, they become a lot more active. And then you have to start checking the wind. And the wind direction is going to determine, because what happens a lot of times is the wind's going to blow them into the river. So you got to see which side of the river the wind is most predominant on, and that's the side that you want to stick to if you're going to fish for these hoppers. <coughs> and this is, this is a good example. You fish right along this grassy bank. They'll be coming out of the grass, but a lot of times I'll see them floating in the seams. They'll get out into the river, so you can't just say I'm going to fish the banks. You need to fish just about the whole river where you've got seams and current that are moving these hoppers down. In the Lamar River in Yellowstone, I fished the seams all day, and just about every other drift, a cutthroat would hit that hopper fly. And then this is... <coughs> Somebody ought to recognize this fellow. <laughs> but again, this is good hopper territory when you got that kind of grass. It heats up during the day, they'll come out. This year when we went out in September, uh, the hoppers really didn't get active till afternoon. It was cool in the mornings, and it wasn't until about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon before we could switch over to hoppers to have them hit. And then you ought to recognize this old guy. That's Reuben. <laughs> and again, this is just good hopper territory. And then this is the results. You know, you can drift right along this bank, drift right out in here, and wham. So let's go ahead and just move to ants. I haven't had much luck with ants, but I know Mac has up at Snowbird. Um, they work best in two feet of water or less. Uh, you want the water moving at a moderate speed, and you need to have some cover on the bottom and on the bank. Usually the ants are going to fall out of trees. So if you've got overhangs, then there's a good chance that your ants are going to come out. Again, it's usually because of wind. Um, and the other thing is that trout eat ants just as much as they'll eat a hopper, maybe more because of the availability. And during the course of the summer, these ants are available. They're, found, they're available during winter. They're year-round type of bug. And then unmatch the hatch. So let's say you're fishing, you're fishing with nymphs or something, and they get turned off. Then you switch to something like an ant pattern on the surface that doesn't match anything they've been eating all day to try to, okay, change their little diet right now. So that's one tactic that you can use. The other thing is a visibility problem, especially for me who can't see very well. So there's a whole different variety of ant patterns. The parachute one is the one I like because I can see it. A black ant floating on the water, I can't see. Now the Chernobyl ant, you can see, 
But these are just, and there's probably another dozen different variety of ants that you could use, foam ants. Um, I have used a snow lamp out in the west and it's been very successful. But technically a Chernobyl lamp's not an ant, it's actually a wasp. And then this is just a red showing trout hitting the red ant. Beetles, you know, who cares, but apparently trout do. Um, beetles like to float close to shore, they like to stay in the eddies. Um, this summer out on Soda Butte, uh, Reuben and I, Sean and Mike Empey were out there and I had a very good day fishing beetles. And then of course, there's a whole variety of them. This one and this one I've had the most production out of. And this flash one. I caught some out there this summer with that one. I tried to take a picture of this one, which I probably caught five or six fish on, out in Soda Butte. And again, I'm fishing next to the shore, Fishing it in the seams, if there's an eddy, let it circle around. Um, and with a beetle, you actually get away with a little bit of drag. So it's not like having to fish strictly with a dry fly. And then spiders. I, I had to look this up because I don't fish spiders. <laughs> but anyway, they like faster water, riffles, and runs. Uh, you don't need to use a lot of action. Um, there's, um, let's see, there's subtle strikes and they can be used year round. I mean, if anybody's fish with spiders, what's your experience with them? Anybody? Yeah, I guess nobody fishes them. <laughs> <laughs> And then these are just different spi uh, spider patterns. So, the other terrestrials you have to watch out for are the big ones. Uh, Yellowstone. <laughs> Buffalo. Watch out, John. <laughs> John, this is on the fire hole, and I believe that buffalo ran you out of the river. <laughs> yeah, he did. He crawled, he crawled right there where I was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He crossed wherever he wants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the other ones I run into, this is right below Harriman's Ranch in Idaho on the Henry's Fork. And there was some moose, and she had three calves she had to watch out for. Yeah. They tend to be a little ornery when they're around their calves. Mm -hmm. So that's all I got to say about terrestrials. <laughs> so, sorry. But. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Yes. Have you tried any on the Saluda ever, or no? No, I have not. Anybody? Yes. Has anybody tried any terrestrials? Yes. Ruben? I don't know what it I've is. Caught, I've caught, uh, I've caught pretty big brown on the Chernobyl. On the Chernobyl land? Yeah, I've been a while. Grasshopper. Pardon? Grasshoppers. Really? What time of day? I caught, time caught them in the evening it's just as after the heat broke. I know Dwight Moffat's not here, but we were chatting. He caught, a, he caught one on a fat Albert, or no, chubby Chernobyl. I, I don't know. One of those bigger foam hopper patterns last week. I know Max caught on uh, Snowbird, you were using an ant pattern, weren't you? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. So. What you called uh, uh, that last category, spiders, mm -hmm. a lot of them are, are, look like they're, they're wet fly patterns. They are. And so, and so I, fish, I fish them on the I've had some success occasionally yeah. on some ones. And also, what I read about them, you can put some floating on them and use them more as a dry. Yeah. And, and then. And you fish spiders, Mike. Pardon? You fish spiders. 
that red wire soft tackle is what you would call a spider. Is it? Yeah. Well, that case, they work real well. <laughs> <laughs> so you're more experienced than you thought. Bill Tide knows, and I've had real good success with that red one. Yeah. John? I caught a good number of fish on the lower saluda on a black ant. And going back to your point about that being difficult to see, they are difficult to see. You can also fish them just like a nymph. Lots of ants get in the water and drown. Fish will eat them off the bottom, I guarantee you that. Really? I know a couple of years ago, you fished one of my green ones and said you'd just torn them away. We had a rainbow that was and evidently, it, it uh, washed some ants down because we ended up pairing them up on the little ants. Yeah. And another thing on uh, away from ants, uh, small small beetles up uh, uh, several times up on the south coast. Uh, they're really the small beetles. The sparkle ones or just the black foam ones with a little orange on them? <coughs> the sparkle? Yeah. I don't, I don't. There's a <laughs> It always comes back to trout chow. There's a black deer hair over peacock beetle that works really well too. If you fish it near overhangs, right? If you like, you're fishing the bank there, and if you fish that black black uh, beetle. It's one of Renee Harrop's patterns. Yeah, I'm trying to... I think that's it, the peacock one right here. That's not the one I tie, but that's, okay. that's what it looks like. Yeah. And in, in the summer, <coughs> in the summer, you can have a lot of fun with the beetle. Okay. I, I wrote a story about uh, our trip on the Nantahala about two or three years ago, and I love to start out, I, I love to fish with a red midge, and so it was my first cast on the Nantahala, a good little drift down, and I let it go all the way to the end of the drift, hooked something, and of course it was a nice log. <laughs> and I lost everything I had, you know, so first cast, first cast I was Been a little there. depressed about it, and, and Dermot, I was thinking about saying an ugly word, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I sat down there, and I had to retie, and I heard something while I'm sitting there pondering what dirty word I wanted to say. <laughs> and a, a trout busted the top. <clears throat> and it was up against a rock ledge, straight down, and then it busted the top again. Then I looked, and I felt something on my neck, and it was, I brushed it off, and I had my fly box open, and it was a black hand landed right in the fly box, right by a black <laughs> it's, a, it's a sign. It's a sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, and so I said, hmm, I'll tie on this black one. I tied it on, and after about 25 fish, that's what was falling off on the other side up against that ledge. Yeah. And I would just cast it and let it hit that ledge and drop, boop, bam, every time. And I just sit right there. And it's a nice little run. It's uh, Reuben, you fish that run a long time. Mag and Mel, all, all these guys, we fished it and had fantastic days. But I sat right there. And I mean, within a little over an hour, I had 25 fish on mm. minimum. And uh, so the next, I got, I finally decided to leave that day a little bit early because the host don't fish the most on my outings. And I said, well, I'll swing by the fly shop. I'm going to go buy some ants. 
shop in there. It's like a CG Fly shop. I purchased a dozen ants. Looked exactly like what I have. Ready for day two now. I had that black ant tied on. I fished it. Not a damn bite. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of bite? <laughs> Darn. Darn. <laughs> but long story short is when when they are hitting ants and they're feeding on them, and you got the right one, you can have a lot of fun. And I did that one day, but of course I wasted my money the next day and I helped out the economy in North Carolina. But anyway, but ant, ants are uh, nothing to play with. They're they're good. They're really good, especially in the spring. That red saw hackle that you type bill, I've caught fish on every river I've fished in with that one. Yeah. That is a very productive fly, both here and out west. I don't I don't think we fish them enough, you know, and I, I, I look down at it. Yeah, I know, I mean I only think about fishing them out west. I don't it never occurs to me to fish them here. Yeah. You know, uh, President Carter was uh, avid fly fishing. Somebody asked him one time, if he only had one fly, what would it be? And he said it would be a black hand. Hmm. I know. One, one of the lessons from this, when we go to the stream, we look to see what's happening. You know? We may not pay a whole lot of attention to the hoppers or whatever the beetles and that kind of thing. But Pay attention to what the weather is doing. If a gust of wind comes up, you know, it is likely it's bumping the rest of it into the water. If a little shower of rain comes up, it's likely it's washed up by the trees into the water. I know out west, if it's warm and the wind's blowing, you know there are going to be hoppers in the river. Uh, the problem is now with my hearing, I can't hear them anymore. You know, but the guy that tells me, no, you can't hear them. They're all over, but you can walk. But I mean, when you get like, I've had good days on the Madison, the Lamar, and so to be, when it's a hopper day, those cutthroats, I mean, you catch one after another, just drifting them. Do worms count as terrestrials? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I was going to talk about squirming wormies, but I've never seen one in a tree. I was going to say that. <laughs> Inchworms, if you, yeah. if you read on uh, Davidson and up through there in North Carolina, they're always preaching inchworms. And I think a lot of people here have fished up there, fished with the little inchworms and done some good. We haven't had on the Saluda, we haven't had any good inchworm hatches lately. Yeah, Roy. Really. I was going to mention on the Watauga trip, our guide <coughs> tied on a, a, a chubby Chernobyl, which, which has some uh, <coughs> poly yarn mm -hmm. on either end. And he tied that on more as an indicator for, for the dropper. And I, I only mm -hmm. saw one time a fish actually went after the, the ant. But it, it had a as an indicator, it was, it was wonderful. It floated much better than, say, a pig in the bottle. Going indicator down. with a hook on it. Yeah. Pardon? The indicator with a hook on it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, there was a chance of somebody, of a fish taking it. But I only remember one time that one made an attempt, uh, but all the others were on the dropper. But the drift seemed to be a lot better. It doesn't happen. I've used it snowblade, I mean out west, yeah. but I've used it on the big hole and I've used it on the ruby with success. And just fishing it alone. And it, they'll hit it. Yeah. I'll tell you, that, that chubby Chernobyl was, and I've got bad eyes too, it was very easy to see. Right. I mean, something like a black ant with me, I hope they snatch it because I'll never know they did it. Yeah. Well, that's it. Thanks, Mike. Great job. Okay.